Robert Farrell. Robert C. Farrell. Robert C. Farrell. Good job, Michael. So, for those of you who haven't been here from the beginning, let me do a real quick, um, real quick uh, recap of what we've done. Uh, I know I don't think we have the uh, video posted from a couple of weeks back, so it might just do to go over this. Does everybody have a copy of this, uh, the Second Peter and Jude, uh, the, the, the integrated text that I put together? Uh, just a couple of words about the text. Um, number one, I integrated it for the sake of uh, the fact that I could. I mean, just for what it's worth, uh, there were two texts that played off of each other, sure. and I wanted to, to see just what that relationship was. Um, thought is that Jude was the was written first, and there were questions about the vala, the validity of Jude, the meaning of Jude, the purpose of Jude, etc. And these questions were basically brought to Peter. Um, the basis for that particular assertion is that number one. Um, Jude seems to be much more declarative in nature. He says things in a declarative way, like, um, you know, he says things like, well, Michael, the archangel, when contending with the devil, disputed about the body of Moses. He's very particular. And Peter seems to play off of that when he says things like, uh, whereas angels, which are greater in power and might, bring not railing accusation against them before the Lord. So you can see how that's a, that's a, a that's a dependent statement. Uh, one's a one's a um, declarative statement, and one's sort of a conditional statement. If, or you know, it says if God spared not the angels, but cast them down to hell, that's a conditional statement. Or whereas angels, which are greater in power, he's making an allusion to something that's already been said. So if you were going to integrate these books, he is commenting on something that's already come up. So the Jude the Jude portion would have to precede that one in order for it to make logical sense. And this is a literary argument. This is based entirely upon the literary nature uh, of these two books. What is their relationship? Um, Peter answers a certain number of questions for which you have to ask yourself, what are the questions? What are the particular questions to these answers? Um, we know, for example, um, when uh, Peter says that we did not follow cleverly um, uh, cunningly devised fables when we made known unto you the power of, uh, and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but we were eyewitnesses of his majesty, for example. Um, the, 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 why does he answer, we did not follow cunningly devised fables when we made known unto you? That is an answer to what question? The question would logically be, is this some kind of cunningly devised fable that you have taught us, right? So he's answering that question. So that question must have been somewhere in his mind for him to have answered it, right? So for there to be an answer implies the question, I guess is what I'm saying. So what does he mean when he says the power and the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ? Well, he follows it with the, um, uh, the statement of how he saw, them on, he, he saw him on the sacred mountain. He saw his power. In other words, he was in his exalted state as were uh, Moses and Elijah, who were also in their exalted state. So that certainly has to do with his power. Uh, it does speak also in Luke that they spoke of, what they, the content of what they were talking about was about the, um, the, uh, what, the things that were imminent, the things that were going to happen in Jerusalem. So in that particular connection, he's speaking about how he saw him on the, um, the, the holy mount, the sacred mountain. But it's also interesting to note that when Jude speaks about the, um, the, the famous quote of Enoch, where it says, And Enoch also the seventh from Adam prophesied of these saying, Behold, the Lord cometh with ten thousands of his saints to execute judgment upon all, and to convince all that are ungodly among them of all their ungodly deeds which they have ungodly committed, and of all the harsh speeches which ungodly sinners have spoken against them. Right? That is also the power in the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Because it, it is about his coming, right? It says, Behold, the Lord cometh with ten thousands of the saints, and his power, what? To execute judgment upon all. So this could this could be a double entendre. And the other the other um, the other line of evidence that we have that Peter might be talking about the book of Enoch when he says the power and the coming, uh, is that later on um, he he mentions that we have a more sure word of prophecy whereunto you do well that you may that you take heed as to a light that shineth in a dark place until the day dawn and the day star arise in your heart, knowing this first, that no prophecy of scripture is of any private interpretation. For prophecy came not in old time 
by the will of man, but holy men spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. So the question is, when he says that holy men of old time were, were uh, as, 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 as the concluding part of that section, right, he's definitely referring to antediluvian prophets because every mention of old time in, in 2 Peter and Jude is with reference to antediluvian age. So in other words, what is sort of the question to that answer? Right? If he's answering the prophecy came not at old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. If old time means antediluvian times, just change it. For the prophecy came not in antediluvian times by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. That changes the entire understanding because now he's defending antediluvian prophets and saying that they are inspired by the Holy Ghost. If that should happen to be yeah. the case, if that should happen to be his intention, that really colors the whole meaning of this book because it seems to be a defense of the uh, prophets of old, the prophets of antediluvian times. So if the question is, is this some cunningly concocted fable? Is this just some, something that came about by the will of man? See, this is something that scholars say about these books, right? That they were written by men, that, they were, that they're cleverly concocted fables. In other words, they're pseudepigrapha, right? But why does Jude encourage us to fight for the faith that was once for all delivered to us? And he insists upon using these books. So they're not other examples in the canonical scriptures, for example, where he could make his point. Why does he insist on these books? And then why is this book, or the, the, the question of this book, brought before Peter, who's actually one of the apostles? I mean, Jude makes one of the one of the assertion that he says that the apostles taught this stuff. Right? So if we imagine the scenario that he makes the allegation that the apostles taught this stuff, somebody questions it. Oh, this is some cleverly concocted fable, they might say. Oh, this is just some, you know, thumped up by the will of man and not by the will of God and not by the will of the Holy Spirit. Like, let's bring this before Peter and see what he has to say. Right? So when they bring it to Peter, like, what is the first thing the Book of Enoch says about itself? It very specifically says it's not for his generation but it's for the time of the removal of the wicked and the ungodly. Now, if there should happen to exist a mechanism within our canonical scriptures, between two entire books, not just jots, not just tittles, not just offhanded remarks, but two entire books that exist within the New Testament that function to say that men of old, men of antediluvian times, right, did not speak by the will of man. They were not cunningly convicted, or not cunningly concocted fables but they were actually inspired by the Holy Ghost. If that's what that means, and this is very important because it hinges on this, if that should be the case, then that would be us coming to a like faith with what Peter had at the beginning. Peter is basically taking the book of Jude and saying, hey, listen, I, I, you, know, you know how he said that the apostles taught this? Well, I'm one of them, right? And he seconds it by saying literally that, that we apostles... Um, um, you know, that, that we believe these things, in other words, he's seconding them, right? So this is sort of the lens by which you have to view all of this stuff. All of the, um, for those of you who have copies of this, and I'll see if I can get one uploaded to my, um, my the uh, scriptural-truth.com website. They see all of these yellow areas, for those of you who have the documents. This is, these are, these are references to extra-canonical books. And so just, and, and these are only the really, really good ones. There's a lot of obscure ones that I could have put on here, but I, you know, I didn't want to act like I was trying too hard. I went to the almost undisputable ones, right? And you can see how much real estate they take between the two letters. You'll notice that some of them are Second Peter and some of them are Jude. So in other words, it isn't just Jude alone who's using these books. They're both coloring outside of the canonical boundaries. They're both coloring outside of those lines. And the, and the, and the, the the questions seem to answer themselves when you sort of derive the questions from the answers. There are people out there who didn't think that this was right. They didn't think it was appropriate. They didn't think that these books were inspired. And you have Jude insisting that they are, and Peter also insisting that they are. So, you know, the question of in the mouths of two or three witnesses, all things should be established. So you have to kind of read it with that lens that there exists the possibility that there is a secondary meaning. Right, which would tend to inform you as to just why he uses the word remembrance. I want you to remember. I want you to come to a that this this book is written to people who have attained a like faith as us. So we understand that during the time of the interim, between the time that the apostles were writing, right, in our time now, that these books have not been 
uh, basically spoken of. They've been swept under the rug, and Christians have basically tried to pretend that they don't exist as far as it's humanly possible to deny their presence, to deny their existence, so much so that a person could go to church their whole life, entire life, and not even know the bare fact mm -hmm. that these books are quoted, right? And so to a person whose mind wants to tend towards truth, to search for wisdom, like, tre like precious treasures or something, right? The search for these precious promises, he talks about it. The fight for the faith that was once for all delivered to the saints. If that is the faith that was once for all delivered to the saints, and Peter's actually fighting for it, right? You see what I'm saying? It, it makes it really hard to deny this. Now, I know that you can take the skeptical route. A lot of, a lot of Christian scholars, a lot of secular scholars, just, to be, just in the interest of fairness, they accuse Second Peter of being a forgery and a fraud. But if that were the case, then that means that in our scriptures, we have something that people say is a forgery and a fraud. Now, whose side are they on? Right? Because this is where the line of demarcation really boils down to. Because if the prophet says something and then men say something, right? let God be true and every man a liar. So if it should happen to be that this, this that Second Peter exists as the defense of this of Jude, and by extension these books, because again, he reads out of these books. He All of the, uh, the, the, the same things that Jude talks about, he seconds in his defense of this book, right? So as you read this book, you can understand that he's, that he's integrating, you know, he's giving it his, basically his stamp of approval. Like, and, and the other thing too, is if there's supposed to be a forgetting that explains, again, like what I was saying before, this constant refrain about remembrance. I want you to recall. I want you to remember, right? As if to say things are going to be forgotten, right? When you read in, in Enoch, the first chapter, and it says that it's not for his generation, but it is for a generation to come, that means that there's a gap. That means that there's an interim period. So it does require also a remembrance, right? But the idea that this book would be restored to us, which is another thing that the book of Enoch says about itself. In 104 and 105, it talks about, and I know this mystery, that scripture shall be given to the wise and the righteous, right? And they will be given the scriptures, and they will rejoice in them, and they will understand them, and they will be able to explain them. And it commands them to then, to then reveal it to the world with that wisdom, right? So that ties in nicely with this, because that's all by way of remembrance, too. The idea is that Peter could have said something very simple, like, Listen, you brought me this book, this book is valid, right? You, you, he's questioning Enoch, I'm telling you Enoch is valid, right? The idea is if he had said that, there would be no interim. You see, there would be no falling away, right? But he does say that there's going to be a forgetting because he talks about remembrance. So that's just implied in a remembrance as a forgetting, right? Because you can't remember what you've known all along. So what we've been taught all along has been taught by people who disagreed with and did not understand his words. And so that's basically all of Christian history, if you really take it like that, right? So when he talks about these people, he has some very negative things to say about them. He calls them all kinds of names. He calls them brute beasts. He calls them wicked. He calls them godless. He speaks about them in very pejorative terms, like not even just like people who don't just understand. I mean, he does bring that up that they don't understand. But he talks about things like willful ignorance. You see, the point is that if... Someone like myself could, in the span of you know 24 hours, piece together something like this, right? That's just as simple and straightforward as it can be. Just put the words where they want to go and see what they say, right? Who's saying what and where and when and why? Just analyze it. Just look at it. E even as an atheist, even as somebody who's not a Christian, you could do that, right? So why hasn't it been done? And why hasn't this point of view ever been pushed? Because it is basically equal and opposite to what, well, the world is taught, right? It is a different view, and it could color the the understanding when he says that this second letter I write unto you, both in which I want to stir you up by way of remembrance, right? Not only could that second letter be Second Peter, you know, the second after First Peter, but it could also mean that like I've written unto you on two different levels, on the level of the flesh, right, for this age, right, and on the level of the spirit for the age to come. Because he speaks of the day, he talks about two things. He talks about the day of judgment. Right, and the when the day start, the day dawns and the morning star rises in your heart. So there's two people. There's people who are going to be judged, right? And then there's people who are going to receive essentially the morning star in their hearts. Remember, Revelation talks about whoever overcomes, I will give you the morning star, which is to say himself, right? Not the false one like like Lucifer, who's bringing you technology and who's bringing you knowledge of the secular sort, right? In a pretense of being the morning star. 
you know, because this again is the third millennium. And so all this technology, the AI and all this stuff that you're seeing now, this is all stuff that because it's inherent in the way that the universe works, other civilizations previous to ours, for example, antediluvian civilization, could have been technological. I don't know that they were or they weren't. There's no indication that they were or they weren't. But the idea is that if that knowledge is to be had, it could have been had before, right? And it could have been had, you know what I'm saying, it could theoretically come after. That might be why the world essentially had to be eliminated, right? Maybe everything had to be buried. Maybe everything had to be you see what I'm saying? Because you go find these artifacts of a previous technological civilization, you could just retrofit everything to that. You know what I'm saying? And just get, you know, that civilization going just as quickly as possible. But, okay, so, I probably don't have too much time, but basically I just wanted to get everybody up to speed on what the implication is of what you're reading here. Uh, because uh, because it's, it's profound. If it, if it is true that he's talking about these books, it means that there's basically um, that that we have received the original faith that was laid down for us to receive, and we have come to a like faith as him. So when it starts out, Jude, the servant of Jesus Christ and brother of James, and Simon Peter, a servant and apostle of Jesus Christ, again, from two sources, from a brother of James, possibly of Yeshua, right, and also Simon Peter, two different very authoritative voices, in other words, right? Right. So again, in the mouths of two or three witnesses, it says that are sanctified by God the Father and preserved in Jesus Christ. Again, the preservation, right? Until the day dawns again and the morning star rises in our hearts. In other words, we're preserved until that moment. And he talks about the wicked also. He knows how to preserve, you know, the, the righteous until, you know, that day and also the wicked. So he's, he's doing preservation, right? And it says that have obtained a like precious faith with us through the righteousness of God and our Savior Jesus Christ. In other words, we've obtained the faith that they had because it says that it was like precious faith with us, right? It says grace, mercy, peace, and love be multiplied unto you through the knowledge of God and of our Lord, of Jesus our Lord. Again, this is knowledge, right? The idea is that if you're if all you're doing is just highlighting, here's a statement here out of this book. And I'm just putting them side by side so you can see that this is saying that, right? That falls a little bit outside of the line of faith and more into the to the to the to the side of knowledge. You know that he's quoting the book of Enoch. You know that he's quoting the assumption of Moses. You know that he's quoting something outside of the canon, right? So as he's doing this, right, it's more in the way of observation. You know, it's something you can just highlight. Highlight over here, highlight over here. It is the same, right? And so it it functions as a, a more certain understanding if you take it at face value it says um, that beloved when I gave all diligence to write to you of the common salvation right that is to say the salvation of us all right there's going to come a time in which it's not just going to be about individual salvation it's, it's going to be about all of us the common salvation how do we all get rectified and justified right it says, according as his divine power hath given us all things that pertain unto life and godliness through the knowledge of him that hath called us to glory and virtue. And it was needful for me to write unto you to exhort you that you should earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. So if Enoch is one of these books that's the faith that was handed down to us, if you take that as his meaning, right, it means that it's something that should be fought for. And as a matter of fact, something that Peter did fight for. Because Peter took again, he took Jude and fought for it. He wrote around it and presented it with his own authority to the world. And as you read a little bit later on, he not only says he not only says that, but he says, "Listen, um, the uh, the yeah, account uh, account that the um, this last page here account that the uh, long suffering of our Lord is salvation, even as our beloved brother Paul also, according to the wisdom given unto him, hath written unto you." as also in all his epistles, speaking in them of these things, in which are some things hard to be understood, which they that are unlearned and unstable rest, as they do the other scriptures unto their own destruction. Um, does he mean other scriptures as in the canonical scriptures, or does he mean other scriptures as in the non-canonical scriptures? It's hard to state, but Paul does quote outside of the lines too. If we take that Paul wrote Hebrews, for example, which either he did or he didn't, but whoever the author of Hebrews did uh, wrote, Whoever wrote the epistle of the Hebrews, right, in, in the chapter of faith, in chapter 11, makes allusion to the second book of Maccabees and also to the, um, and also to the um, martyrdom of Isaiah. So those are two extra canonical 
statements that are written. But that's just Hebrew. He also talks about the third heaven. He also talks about uh, that Satan, that Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light, right? So that's another allusion to the life of Adam and Eve. So the idea is that that Paul is also teaching about these things according to wisdom, in the same way that that Peter and Jude are teaching about these things. And so he's basically extending that out into the other scriptures. So anyway, I guess that's probably about all I have time for today. But but basically, that's a that's kind of an overview of the book. Um, you guys want to hear more? Or do we have time? Yeah, that's okay. Another five ten minutes, right? Okay. So, but in other words, why was it needful for him to write unto them? Because it's a necessary part of our restoration to understand it. It is needful for us to fight for these things. And Peter saw it as needful, right? So the idea is that it's a necessary ingredient. It's a necessary teaching. It's a necessary step in order to regain what was taught early on is to, to catch why he's doing what he's doing and why he's writing what he's writing. And why is he coloring outside of the line so much? You know, I hate to keep saying that, but it's just a constant refrain that, that the authorities that were, that came in, he talks about them being fleshly. He talks about them being ungodly. He talks about them being willfully ignorant. It takes a certain willful ignorance to bury this stuff. It takes a certain uh, turning away from that knowledge. This is why it makes it so important. When you read the other so-called Catholic letters, you know, James, Peter, John, and Jude, they're called the Catholic letters. And to some extent, the letters that, that Jesus uh, narrates to the seven churches, for example, they all speak of a falling away. They all speak of what's going wrong in these churches, for the most part. With James, it's mostly a matter of uh, you know the the wealthy and the you know the the powerful, the eminent, or whatever having preeminence over the regular person. You shouldn't ask the regular person to sit on the floor. You know what I'm saying? That kind of stuff. And uh, you know Peter, the same thing, right? He's like he's defending Jude, you know, and he's talking about how you know how Paul writes about all of this stuff. You, know, you, you understand what I'm talking about, you'll understand what he's talking about, that kind of thing. So why is he's vouching for Jude and he's vouching for, for Paul in these things, in this matter, right? And he's very specific about that, why? You see, and then with John, it's the same thing. It, it, Peter talks about they have, they, they speak evil against dignities, right? Now we read in Third John where John, who was a dignity, I mean, he actually put his head on Yeshua's chest, right? Mm -hmm. And a person named Diognus would not allow him in his church, right? And they, he said that they prayed it against them with malicious words. So he's speaking evil of a dignity, and he's despising authority. You see how this all ties in together? So all of these Catholic books are basically talking about that. And I say that because that's what they're called, the Catholic books, not that they're Catholic in nature. But, but that's just the, 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 the term that's used for them. But you see, the idea is that all of these books function, right, to show us that the church was falling away. That the church was being taken over by these people. And these people, again, of all of the, the nasty things that get said about anybody in the Bible, right, these people have some of the nastiest things said about them. And I don't think that's for no reason. These people are every bit as evil and every bit as wicked to have done that. Because Peter actually in his letter also says that it would have been better for them not to have known of the way of righteousness than to have turned their backs on the sacred command that was handed down to them. So if this teaching was that, if, if, he, if they were teaching out of the book of Enoch, if they were teaching out of the uh, Assumption of Moses, if they were teaching out of the life of Adam and Eve, if they were teaching out of Second Magnus, if they were teaching out of all of these books that you're reading, all of these outside the line stuff. And these people come and they impose these lines. And they say, listen, it's just this and not that. Right? Just here and not there. Right? Then they're cutting off your ability to follow the Lamb wherever yeah. He goes. They're cutting off your so ability. So who are these people that they're talking about that said no you can't include this well one of the Way things he says one of the things he says is that forget not this one thing that a day is with the lord is a thousand years and a thousand right. years there as a day right. right now barnabas echoes the same thing when he says that the lord says that the day shall be as a thousand years and a thousand years shall be as a day where does that put them on the timetable that puts them mm -hmm. at the fifth day right so so they're they're hearing oh you're telling me it's going to be another two thousand years right because if there's if the day is as a thousand years and six thousand years are given over to man and we're only here at four thousand, that means there's two thousand more years to go. There's no way we're putting this off for two thousand years. There's no way we're following you, right? The kingdom is here. The kingdom is now. Is what they're saying, right? That you follow us, not them. They're teaching you that this isn't for a long time off, right? And Peter's explaining to them that yes, it is a long time off. 
And this is the patience of the saints. The, the book of Revelation talks about this too. Herein lies the patience of the saints, right? They're like screaming, how long, how long, how long, oh Lord? Right? The idea is that there is this, this waiting time. There is this interim period. But he wants all to come to salvation. And that includes us. We wouldn't have existed 2,000 years ago. Therefore, we wouldn't have been in heaven. Right? So he's got a whole, whole congregation, a whole group of people that he wants to include in his plan. Right? And they are on that day, the, the day, the third day, or the seventh day, depending on how you look at it. Seventh day from creation, third day from Yeshua, right? However you want to look at it, it's still the same day. The day dawns and the morning star rises in the hearts of some, right? And then that day of destruction and the, the removal of the heavens and the earth that now are. Because when he talks about the heaven and the earth, wherein there lies no corruption, where there is no um, corruption, right? The contrast to that is the is the world not of the future but the world now. The heavens and the earth, metaphorically anyway, are not are temporal because they are to be destroyed. They are to melt like wax. In other words, like it says in the Book of Enoch, first chapter, right? The mountains shall melt, right? And he talks about this melting away with the fervent heat. You know what I'm saying? So that's another allusion to what's going to happen. But it's just it's just this <coughs> constant refrain of this book. It insists on these books. So it doesn't matter whether you believe it or not, whether you like it or not. The fact is it's written, and it is there. It is insisted. You know what I'm saying? And he's saying it's necessary, right? So it's it's not like, oh, that would be great if you knew this, or, oh, here's something extra, here's a little sprinkles on top of whatever. He's saying this is essential, right? This isn't just some frou-frou thing that you do on the side just to, you know, kind of whatever. And he says... Yeah, um, yeah, beside this giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue, and a virtue knowledge, and a knowledge temperance, and a temperance patience, and a patience godliness, and a godliness brotherly kindness, and brotherly kindness charity. This is, I mean, it's very formulaic, right? But what he's saying is that you already have faith, you already believe, right? Now, be virtuous, right? A virtuous person doesn't negate or deny the Lord. A virtuous person doesn't doesn't destroy the truth or hide the truth or bury it and put it under a bushel, right? A virtuous person, it explains what virtue is. When he went to the church of the Bereans, right, these people were more virtuous than other people, right, because they actually listened, right? And even with Martha and Mary, it's who was listening that was in the right. So in other words, you have to have faith, but you also have to listen to it. Right? Why in the chapter of faith, for example, you read in the book of Hebrews, the chapter of faith, right? You know, faith is a substance of things hope, you know, for the evidence of things not seen, blah, 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 blah. And still in the chapter of faith, he talks about the faith of, you know, the woman who would receive her child in the next world, which is an allusion to the second book of Maccabees. And he also says that prophets were sawn in half, which is an allusion to the martyrdom of Isaiah. So if you can't make it all the way through the, the book of, the, the chapter of faith, for example, in the book of Hebrews. You can't make it all the way through that without mm -hmm. chucking your faith out the window, without trying to hide the fact that these are, like you won't find in your cross references, on most Bibles you won't find that. Maybe you find a study Bible, maybe you find a scholar Bible, but on your average Bible that you buy anywhere, it's not going to make those allusions, it's not going to make those cross references, right? But that's a subtle form of deception. It's something that's known, but it's withheld from you, right? And so that's what these weak, wicked people do. They know things and they withhold them from you. Right. right, But then wholesome thinking is the antidote for all this. To put it all together in a wholesome way, in an, its entirety, in other words. And you look at the totality of the evidence, and you affirm the totality of the evidence. This is the unavoidable, unescapable conclusion. So do you suggest reading all the apocryphas and trying to it, connect them? There, there's, a, there's, a certain, there's a certain something to be said about that. There, there, there is a language, and this is something that... You can delve into if you come to my channel, or if, I don't know if the doctor lets me delve into that. I might delve into that a little bit more here. But it's like if I gave you just a book, any book, and I said, is this written in English or not? And you were a speaker of the English language, you could look at it. It doesn't matter what the book is. You could say, yeah, that's written in English, right? Okay, so if, if the scriptures have a certain, a certain code to them, if there's certain keys, right, the keys of knowledge, right, the keys of understanding, Right, he gives us an idea of what these things are. The son of the the sower is the son of man. That's a key, right? The seed is the word of God. That's a key, right? The the ground is the world because it's the earth, the world, the earth. You know what I'm saying? There's a there's a there's a mat there's a certain method to the madness, let's say, right? And so he's telling you, okay, so these are keys, and these are things that the scribes and the Pharisees and the lawyers have taken and hidden away from us, right? 
You see, and so this he's describing their character. They're they're wild waves of the sea, foaming up their own shame, right? They're clouds without water. In other words, they don't have the scriptures with them, right? They don't rain that down on you. In other words. So the deception really began with the Pharisees. The deception began early on in Christian age. This is why Diotrephes, for example, was able, apparently successfully, to expel John and all of his followers from his church. And why is this recorded? He says, when I come back, I will, I will rail against him. Right, with the, I will I will stand against them. Right, so in other words, if all of the Catholic epistles and the letters to the, the churches by Yeshua even in, in Revelation speak to all of these things, you see some of the same words: morning star, morning star. You know, uh, just the the this this it's telling a story about the unraveling of the church, and it's being taken over and infested by the synagogue of Satan. Right, it's forming itself in the image of Judaism. Right. Um, that it talks about like the, um, the 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 teachings of people like the, like Jezebel's you know Jezebel the, the teaching of the Nicolaitans and all these other teachings these evil people that are prompted you're constantly told about these evil people and these evil teachings right and so that when you read that you have to believe it like you have to understand that the Every, every church history that I've ever looked at or read and it is always sort of treated as though it was the uh, triumph of Christianity. That Christianity triumphed over all of this stuff. That it actually emerged out, out of the, 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 the controversy and the problems or whatever. And it well, we can say that it did, but not 100%. More. Well, but, they, but what happened was, if you cut off these teachings, Right, and you impose, like I said, the canon, that which is what the, the the Jews had done. They had imposed a canon, right? Then that means that whatever internal evidence you have to overlook, whatever whatever points you outside of those boundaries, you have to like wear those blinders. You're like that bonsai tree that can only your roots can only go so far, and that's gonna that's gonna affect your growth and your productivity, right? Whereas if you if you understand that those boundaries don't actually exist and that they are imposed, and you look at the character of the people who impose them, that's what this book is trying to tell you. These people are, are bad. These people didn't do it by mistake. They knew the mystery and they turned their back on it, right? And it would have been better for them not to have known. Why? Because, I mean, again, because they did know, now they're guilty for, for willful ignorance and for lying and for covering up the truth and being co-conspirators with Satan against God, against his truth. Gotcha. Thank you. Thank you.